So good morning. My name is Anastasia Zarinova, and we have with us today Dr. Rebecca Kilik and Jamie Chapman, uh, who are going to run a workshop for us on introduction to change report analysis. Um, we don't have much housekeeping to mention, uh, just to let you know uh, this session is being recorded, um, and it all will be available for all delegates to view later. Um, also, please keep your microphones muted, but if you want to have your cameras on, you're very welcome to, because it will add this interactiveness and we will at least know that there are people in the room, uh, because it can be quite daunting trying to talk to um, about 18 uh, black squares. Um, also, um, just to let you know, we want to issue certificates of attendance for everyone um, who attended the session. So if you want to have a certificate from us, uh, please, uh, can you write your full name in the chat um, in the chat box, you can see ch hopefully um, chat um, icon. And if you can't find the chat icon, please um, raise your hand or shout at me. Uh, and by the way, yes, there are also reactions button on the uh, bottom panel when you can put thumb up and the clap um, when everything is okay. And there is also raise hand functionality in the participants um, uh, panel. Um, also, as you possibly already know, a uh, workshop will be run in our studio cloud and we'll share links with you shortly. Um, so we still have people coming. Um, I think I will now um, give uh, um, after introduction or back over to you. Uh, please feel free to start this workshop. Okay, thank you very much. Um, hi everyone. Um, so I'm Rebecca Killick. I'm Associate Professor at Lancaster University and um, my research is in change point analysis. So I'm going to deliver an introduction to change point course today. Um, so I think the, the first thing is going to be just to get everybody on the um, system and for everybody to have a copy of the, the notes in front of them. Um, so I'll just wait for that's come up. There we go. So just inside the chat, there's there's a, a, a link to the um, R Studio Cloud. Uh, so if everybody can just open that, I'll kind of. So there seems to be absolutely tons of projects on the R community cloud space. Uh, so I think we'll have to wait for it all to load. At least it does on mine. Um, let me share my screen so that you guys can see what, what I can see. So I, I see on the R Studio Cloud <laughs> site just absolutely tons and tons and tons of different uh, you can um erect you can if you scroll all the way up there is a search button you can see uh, oh, okay yes so you can um, so if you put change point in there oh it doesn't come up oh <laughs> uh, well i don't know let's have a quick look how chris named it then uh, hmm. Yeah, I'm just searching with you now as well. Yeah. Um, no, that doesn't help either. I can't find it on there. I will contact us right now. Sorry about this. It's all right. If we if we go to the um, conference materials, we can see in here that if you go on to the GitHub page for the introduction to R, that's where all of the materials are here. So these are all of the um, materials. So you can, de depending on what you want to do, whether you prefer to download the, the whole repository. So you can do um, code download zip there, or you can clone the repository into your own GitHub space um, either way. Um, so this contains um, 
uh, data set on GP visits that we're going to look at today, um, the R markdown, so that has all of the code that creates all of the slides, and then the workshop PDF, so you can prefer the um, PDF um, directly if, if, if you want to. Um, so I'm, I'm on a Linux system here, so there's um, one slide where it doesn't work for me, but it does for you guys um, if, if you're on uh, Mac or, or Windows. Um, but it's, it's just a little video to, to try and explain things a little further. Um, so I'll start the session by um, into my slides. So I'll start the session here just by kind of giving an introduction to, to what change points are. And then throughout the session today, we'll have little breakout points whereby I'll set you a, a small task to do. And I'll take that opportunity to have that as a break first, followed by a task. Um, so that, that, you know, whichever way around people want to do it, I'm, I'm gonna encourage you to do, take time away from the screen, go get a drink um, and just have, have a little break away from looking at the screen for a bit, but then to come back and um, actually start to do some analysis yourself on, on some of these data sets that we're going to look at today. Okay, um, so it'd be, it'd be really helpful um, if you guys could uh, maybe start populating the, the chat with kind of what your background is. I'm especially interested, um, you know, have you done um, a course in statistics before or, or not? Um, that's kind of the key thing for me to kind of be able to pitch this at the right level for, for everybody that's in, in the room. Um, I'm, I did say on the, on the course introduction that I do expect you to um, have our knowledge and how to build models in, inside R and, and work with data in R. So it'd be good if you could also kind of say um, just, just a quick one sentence in the chat about, you know, do you have, you know, what, what's your level of statistics knowledge and what's your level of R, R knowledge, just so that I can kind of pitch the first bits. So I'll wait a few minutes for, for you guys to, to do that. Thanks, Lisa and Oscar. Welcome. Okay, thanks, C. Tate. It seems like we've, we've got a mix as most people have some level of statistics um, and most people have some stuff at R. We've got Naomi and Emily, thanks. And Joan and Jennifer. Thank you, everybody. That, that, um, really helps in, in terms of knowing how to pitch this going forwards. Okay, good, All right. So if, if we get going, so what we're gonna to cover today is um, these sections. So we're gonna start off by thinking about what change points are, and I'm gonna introduce some notation that I'm going to use ac across um, this course and also um, the course in, in two weeks time if, if anybody's um, going to join there as well. The main focus that I'm going to talk about today is on uh, what's called likelihood based change points. So anybody who's been used to model building, linear regressions, that sort of thing, um, they're, they're typically likelihood based as well. So th that will breed some familiarity if, you, if you're um, familiar with those. Um, and I'm going to talk about three main functions um, that's within the change point package. That's um, to deal with changes in mean only, 
to deal with changes in variants and to deal with both mean and variants. And so the mean and variants does include kind of count data as well, where we can have pass on or, or exponential assumptions. I'm going to address the, the question of how many changes and how we decide how many changes there are within um, a, a, a data set that we have, and then talk about doing non-parametric change points as well. Um, so that's kind of moving away from that likelihood based assumption and looking more for changes in generic distribution at that point. And hopefully we'll be able to get to the last bit, which is about checking assumptions. Um, if we don't manage to get to that today, I will include it in, in, in the one um, in two weeks time. So for those of you who aren't aware, so we have the introduction course today and um, we're going to go up till half past 12 and maybe finish a little bit early if, if um, we manage to get through everything. Um, it's the first time I'm doing this in an online setting, so any feedback from you guys would be really, really welcome in terms of how you're finding following this um, and the tasks and things like that. Um, and then um, there'll be a further change point session in two weeks time, which is going to cover more complicated types of changes and more dealing with more complicated data dependencies and things like that. Um, so, yeah, so I'm going to have tasks throughout the sections today. Um, the typical framework will be I will explain something and then we will have a task on that for, for you guys to try and get practice of that yourself. Um, I'm very happy if people want to you know, use their own data instead of some of the data from the course or if anybody has any questions um, related to their own data as well. I'm very happy to answer those as, as we go through. Um, and then we can um, kind of take those and go forwards. Um, being on this course, this isn't the only time you're going to have access to, to me. I'm, I'm very open for you to email me following the course if you have any questions or if you want to check that something that you've done um, is appropriate and things like that. I'm very happy for you to kind of contact me follow, following the course um, with anything that, that, that you need going forwards. But this is kind of the structure that, that we're going to follow today. Um, I'm going to start off with just covering off um, that change points are known as many, many different types of, um, uh, so they, they have many pseudonyms. Um, there's kind of break point segmentation. If you come from more of an economics background, you probably think of them as structural breaks or regime switching. Um, if you're more from an environmental background, then detecting disorder is, is kind of a, a common term there. And the you can, you know, they're very useful in a wide range of um, fields, uh, including those listed there, and obviously not limited to um, just that list. So I think a lot of the um, recent uh, COVID restrictions and, and lockdowns and things have been, um, have seen a surge in the use of change point methods because um, it was very much, you know, you have, um, so some kind of normal that may be shifting, but then when something like um, the, the first lockdown happened where everybody had to close or, or where people started panic buying items, um, then the distribution of how those things, how your data look, it can just suddenly change overnight. And so this is really what, what change points is, is used for. So kind of to put that a bit more, more mathematically, I'm gonna say that we have um, some ordered data so it doesn't have to be a time series um, where it's collected over time. Um, there's an example later on where, where we're going to look at some genomic data where it's ordered over, over a genome. So as long as you have some ordering to your data, there's a reason you know, why um, one, one time point should come before or after another time. Uh, I'm going to say time point, but I mean data point. Um, data point. Then um, that, that can... Um, be classed as as in this general framework of, of time series okay so it's it doesn't have to be ordered by time it's just some um ordering of data and i'm going to use the term time series interchangeably with 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 that so we're going to have some data i'm going to call data y through throughout this um um, um workshop today and then we're going to have um n data points okay so we've got data y1 to yn and conceptually speaking, if, if a change point um, exists within a data set, what that means is that the distribution of Y1 to Y Tor, where our change point is at, at Tor here, is different from Y Tor plus one to N, okay? And so 
they can be different in many different ways. And we've got some examples here on the slides where the, the first one um, is a change in mean, where we clearly have a, have a mean of one, followed by a mean of zero, followed by a mean of two, followed by a mean of a half. And the, these points here where, where they suddenly shift um, are called the change points. So we've got 100 here, at 250 here, and then at 425 here. And so within each, uh, so um, this part here between two change points and again here and again here is called a segment, okay? And so within a segment of data that we have uh, in, in our uh, change point model, that statistical distribution there is going to be stationary. So we have the same distribution for all of the time points here. And similarly within these bits, we have the same distribution for all of the time points here but crucially, this distribution is different in some way from this first distribution. Okay. And so you can now kind of start to see why something like COVID um, and the lockdown will have dr potentially drastically changed the distribution of the data that you're getting. Okay. The middle one here is um, a change in variance. So at the same time points here, so 100, 250 and 425, we have changes in variance. So here we're going from a smaller variance to a larger variance then it goes smaller again, then it goes larger again. And in all of this, um, what, what we're basically saying is, is that um, some, distri some distributional property changes. So the first one, it's the mean, the second one, it's the variance. And then in, in this third one here, it's, it's the trend. Okay, so we have a, a, a stationary um, linear trend here. Um, and by stationary, I'm saying that the parameter um, estimates are constant over time. Um, and then we have um, a stationary trend here going down and then going up again. And you'll, you'll note that I'm not joining here. So there are some um, change point methods for changes in trend where you can insist that, that they join at these time points, but I haven't done used that method in uh, this example. But all of these are different types of change that, that we might be interested in. And one of the most important questions in, in any analysis um, is what is the most appropriate model? Okay. Whenever we look at a new data set, that's kind of how, how do I model this? This is um, one of the typical questions that we'll ask ourselves. And so when we're thinking about change point analysis, we're kind of thinking, not, not only are we thinking about, you know, should we include a trend? Should we include these covariates and, and things like that? We're also thinking what, what what can change and what has to stay constant, okay, from our, our kind of understanding of, of the world. So this is how, how I view change points is, is that um, we have some ordered data and there's time points within that ordered data where between two time points um, the distribution is stationary. Okay. So kind of from that point of, well, what, what does it, a change point analysis look like or what does a change point model look like? Um, what's kind of the inference that we want to make from, from these change point models? So sometimes it's simply, has a change occurred? You only want to know yes or no, has at least one change occurred within this data set? Um, and th that typically is, is in, we're, um, in applications such as quality control, where they're not interested in necessarily when the change occurred or anything like that or what the change was they just want to know has something changed because then they need to um, stop their processes and um, similarly um, in in other kind of um, computer um, applications they're, they're just interested in are things normal yes or no and if they're not normal then we need to do something um, so the first question is a fundamental one of has a change occurred, but the majority of um, methods for change point analysis also answer the second one, which is if a, if a change has occurred, where is it? Um, or where are they if there's more than one? And so when you've decided that there's a change point or, or several change points and you know where they are, then typically you, you may want to have inference over, well, what's the difference between the pre and post change? So it, it could be, for example, um, 
Here we've got different mean structure, so it could be we're interested in are the means um, higher or lower in different segments, or it could be the variance or, or the trend estimates, etc. And um, so that's what I mean by what's the difference between the pre and post change data there. It could be the type of change or it could be the parameter values that we're looking at. Um, another, another interesting question is um, what's the probability that a change has occurred, as in, um, you know, we might have said a change has occurred, but we need to have some kind of quantification of our certainty that that has occurred or um, where the location is, as, as in the second one. And then all of these questions can be asked again, adding on how many changes have occurred there. The question that we don't typically um, answer in statistics is why has there been a change? So typically the, the role of the, the statistician is to model the data and then talk to domain professionals and people who know um, the ins and outs of the data to answer the question, why has there been a change? Okay. Um, so I personally don't tend to, to deal with that part. Um, I tend to collaborate with others as to why a change might have occurred. Okay. So just to kind of cement down some more notation going forward. So if, if we have this um, time series here, then we're going to call um, tau one as our first change point and tau two as our second change point. I'm also going to label zero here as our tau zero, um, just for, for as we go for notation forwards, because that, that will help me in, in my loops and things rather than having special cases. And then also um, here, uh, the end of our data, I'm also going to have the end of our data as, as a change point location. Again, just to help with that um, um, writing down mathematically what we're doing. Okay. So in this example here, we would have two change points. I'm, I'm going to use um, the uh, letter M for the number of change points. So I'd have M is two in this case. Um, and so therefore here I would have tau three as being N, which is 300. Okay. So if we just take this model here that we've got and kind of write it down mathematically what we mean. So if we're looking at a change in mean here, what we're basically saying is that our data point at time T is going to be equal to one, one of these means. And then obviously we can add our returns on as, as, as well as appropriate. But we're, we're saying that it's generated from, from one of these means here. And the mean that we pick depends on where our T is. So we've got an index by T here. And depending on where T is, depends on which, um, which mean that you pick. So I said, I'm gonna use M for the number of change points. And so if I have, um, two change points here, I'm going to have one, two, three segments. Okay, so we always have one more number of segments that, than we have change points. So that's kind of reflected in this mu m plus one here. And I said, I'm going to take that to be equal to the length of the data n. Okay. So depending on where we are in the time series depends on, on what um, mean that we're going to take. And so if we actually look at this as a, as a series in um, overall, this is what's called a non-stationary time series because the where you are within the data depend um, will depend on what parameters or, or what model you're going to pick. Okay, it's the simplest version of a non-stationary time series because all it is is it's a piecewise stationary series. So each of our pieces um, are stationary and we just kind of glue them together at the change point locations. And overall, we'll have a non-stationary time series, but within the pieces, it's a stationary time series. And so we can just use our usual um, stationary models on each of the pieces separately. Okay. So I've got some more complicated types of change here. Um, time to check you were listening and check your, your keeping up with us. So I'd, I'd like you just in the chat, just to um, indicate, um, can you pick out both the timing of a change and what is changing in these two more complicated examples? And um, yeah, pr prizes for the best answer. <laughs> uh, so I'll, I'll give you a few minutes to have a look. If you just want to take a guess at one, then that's fine. And um, if you indicate in the chat left or right for them, and we'll, we'll kind of see what you guys come up with.
the question is what is changing and when in these two graphs Okay, yeah. So you take, I, see, I see what you mean. So, so you're saying it looks like a, a trend with change points at the top and the bottom. Interesting. So, so you'd have a trend down, trend up, trend down, trend up. Yep. I can see that. Lisa on the right. Yep. Coming up with the same thing. Interesting. So left is seasonality change at 225. Okay. And right is seasonality change at 225 again. Interesting. Yeah, change in the period. I, I get you, Oscar. So change on the left, variation, possibly frequency halfway through. Interesting. Right is variance about 100. Okay, yeah. These are all good guesses. Um, I'm hoping everybody's finding this difficult. <laughs> Have we got any more of this? Change in variance on the right, yeah, good. Okay, thanks Tom, thanks for saying that the, the, the left alludes to you, that's good, it's good to know. It's, it's really, really difficult when we're looking at these graphs, especially if you're not used to looking at, at time series, um, because it's, um, you know, th there's a sense of training your eye to, to spot things um, that, that you may not otherwise see, so if, if, if you're, struggling don't worry because these are difficult examples so I, i'll as, as we've got quite a few answers in i'll give you some hints okay so this one on the left here what what we can see is um so when i look at this i i see that it's quite dense here so we, i'm, I'm going to give you kind of a, a layman's instruction here um oh I left another change about 400 yeah interesting so here you can kind of see that that you've got more dense black is, is probably the, the way that you can see it. So, so you've got um, observations that are going, um, not varying too much. So, so you get quite a lot of dense blackness on this side. Whereas on this side, you've got a lot more, um, you know, you don't have that dense black. So things are going up and down and things. So this one is actually a change in correlation. So here we've got at the beginning of the data set, you've got quite a strong correlation. And so the, the values tend to follow one another um, with some variation, but you've got some strong correlation on this side. And as we move from left to right, the correlation gets weaker. So um, in pieces. Now, where those pieces are is really, really difficult to see in this. Even, even for me, who, who works with this data all the time, it's very, very difficult to see. You can clearly see that this part of the data set here at the beginning is very different from this bit in the middle, but actually being able to pinpoint down the observation where that changes I can't do. Okay, we can probably give a range of values where we think, oh, I think it's probably somewhere in between here. So probably somewhere around this uh, just before 200 here, I, I would probably say. Um, and then again, um, just just as Oscar has said that there is another change across on the right towards 400. Um, because this bit here is also um, less dense than, than the bit on the right. And so that's how we can spot changes in correlation. This is all with a zero mean process, okay? So it's really difficult when we don't have a mean structure going on. Imagine how hard that is to do when you have, you know, maybe either a mean structure or a trend structure or some kind of seasonality structure underneath. It's just gonna be really, you know, you're not gonna be able to see it by eye at all. And um, so these two examples here are just to demonstrate that the simple, change point um, data sets and simulations that, that we're going to work through today are simple versions. And so you can get much more complicated. And when you go into um, the types of analyses for these, the same premises that we're talking about today are applied to those new situations. Okay, so the things that we're learning today in these simple scenarios, the same principles will be applied to all of these more complicated um, data structures. Of course, we can do things differently as well, but often a, sim a simple um, approach is, is the best. And the one on the right here, so people have spotted um, that 
so people were spotting a trend here down and up and down and up um, but there's obviously things going on at the top so this is actually a seasonal behavior here so, so it's kind of a sine wave within the data okay you can model this as, as trend 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 you'd be like trend flat trend flat so that's just like approximating a curve um, with straight lines okay so that's the same so you can do that if if that is appropriate for the application that you're working on where you believe that those changes have occurred um, you can certainly imagine you know um, for example sales of a product may be the same you know you have a promotion so the sales increase and then they're steady for a bit and then you maybe drops drop the promotion or the, or the market saturating that comes back down again um, so there you might expect a piecewise linear uh, approach. This one was simulated from a, um, a seasonal um, sine wave. Uh, and then what you can really notice here is kind of within the second half of the plot, you've got three peaks, whereas in the first half, you've just got two. So that kind of shows me that the, the width or, or the time to go from top to bottom is decreased in the second half than it is in the first. Okay, or the time between the two bottoms that can often be easier. So you've got over 100 here, whereas between these two is um, just under 100. Okay, so that's a change in um, the frequency. So well done to whoever spotted that. And um, so that's a change in the frequency. But as has been already no noticed as well, is that there's a variance change here as well. So the variance, if, if you just look at the peaks and the troughs to, to kind of note that the variance here is smaller than the variances over, over on this side as well. Okay. But again, these are really, really difficult to spot. A, you know, when you haven't had um, large experiences in change point analysis or, or this type of time series. Um, but also because that mean structure kind of masks your view of everything else. So if I remove that mean structure, that variance change would be much more obvious and um, kind of akin to um, this kind of structure here that we've got. So not the same, but um, similar on that one. So well done guys, um, you're, you're awake in, in the morning um, and these are more complicated things. So we'll, we'll deal with some of these in um, types of structures um, in the second course. Um, and um, yeah, so stick around for that if you, if you want to know how to deal with some of those. Okay. So a key difference that I want to kind of say at this point um, is there, there are two kind of tracks for change point analysis. One is um, to have an online setting. So this is where you're monitoring um, some um, process and you want to signify as soon as possible when a change has occurred, okay? So I've already mentioned process and control and intrusion detection for, for that kind of scenario where the, the goal is to be as fast as possible to say when something has happened, okay? Now, these days we kind of think of online um, as this kind of process where you're constantly getting data coming in. Now there's that setting, but there's also the kind of batch setting whereby maybe you know every hour you'll get a batch of data as some sensor or some um, process updates itself. So the, the key thing in the, in the online context is, is your goal is the quickest detection. So you have to balance that against um, false alarm rates. So you've kind of got quickest detection versus false alarm rate. That's kind of the trade-off that you're doing there. And you really need to be careful about um, how long it takes you to process the data that come in. So these kind of complicated models here, you're not going to be able to process especially if you're looking at intrusion detection where you've got um, you know, billions of data points flying at you in, in, in nanoseconds, you're not going to be able to fit a really complicated model like this um, to that type of data. Okay. In contrast to that kind of online setting, we've got the offline setting. So this is whereby we'll process all of the data in one go. Okay. So you may have um, a research question or some goal that you want to, to answer and you process all of the data in one go. And the goal there is not for fastest detection because you know, we have all of the data. Notionally, there's some element of time that it will take, but the goal there is accuracy of, of a change so that we get as close as possible to where the true change point location is. Because in, in online settings, typically 
as I said, this has come from process and control where the quickest detection, you don't care where the change is, you just want to know as, as fast as possible because you want to stop the process because that means something has gone wrong, okay? In offline, it's accuracy of detection because you want to make inference based on where those changes are. So that could be in genomics or, or in audiology, whereby you're, you're wanting to detect where is that boundary? Where is that boundary? Because where that boundary is will affect decision-making, okay? Or, or inference going forwards. So um, as, as kind of an example, um, when we were, looking at the data related to um, the first lockdown, you often find that you get a change point a week before the official lockdown. And that's because a week before, that's when people were starting to realize the severity and companies were saying, yeah, no, you don't need to come in, you, you can work from home sort of thing. Um, and so we see a lot of um, the um, change points a, a week earlier than the official lockdown because that's when people started to do their reactions that's when people started to do their bulk buying that working from home things like that and so it's interesting um, that you know one may have thought that it would have been the lockdown but actually it's if, if you look at the data people change their behavior um, initially a, a week before um, on average um, from that so if we were to kind of just, so there's the flip side to change point analysis, which is um, a lot of people, um, if you're analyzing trials or if you're analyzing policies, what you'll do is you'll say, oh, the policy was put in place on this date. So it's kind of intervention analysis. What's different before this date from after this date? So that is not change point analysis because you, you, you have your date in mind and you're looking at the pre versus post as kind of two samples. Um, we do a lot of kind of two sample comparisons within change point analysis. Oh, hi, Stephen, welcome. Um, so um, we have a lot of change point analysis and um, with it, sorry, two sample comparison within change point analysis, but we, we're not saying this is the date like you would do in intervention analysis. Now, I would argue that even in intervention analysis, what you want to do is you want to do a change point analysis whereby you let the data tell you, has there been a change? And then you look at where the change point is located. And if it's located after your intervention, then maybe there was a lag or you know, some kind of um, difference between um, what, when you put the intervention in place and people reacting to that or the data having a chance to kind of roll through from that. So that's kind of the, the difference between the online and the offline and intervention analysis. The goal in offline is to get that change point as accurate as possible, given the data that we have, okay? Um, and so that's really what I'm going to talk about today. Um, all of, so the multiple change point stuff that I'm talking about later can be used in an online setting. So where you don't have to redo the analysis every time um, new data comes in. Um, but I'll talk about that when, when we get there. Okay. So we're gonna talk about offline. So this is where our goal is to have the most accurate detection possible. And just to kind of put that pictorially, um, so in the online setting here, um, this is um, the online setting on the left. So we, we have our change point location is the black line at time point 100. And if we're processing this data one time point at a time, when we get to the red line here, that's when we signify that there's been a change at 100. So we have a delay and we will always have a delay um, with online change point detection, you can't just get one data point afterwards and say, oh, there's been a change. Because if you kind of look at that first data point afterwards, that's actually within the bounds of um, the previous observations that we've seen. We would be signifying false alarms for all of these um, data points that were coming through. Um, so there's always going to be a delay. The, the goal is to minimize that delay as much as possible, okay? Whilst you know, maintaining our false alarm rate. Um, so at the red line, we would signal that, that we have the black, but we don't have any of this gray data here to do that. Okay. Whereas in offline analysis, we would have the whole data here and we would signify that the change was at 100 based on using this whole data after, after the change. Okay. Good. Okay. If anybody has any questions as we go along, please do um, pop them in the chat. Um, Jamie will... Um, highlight them, answer them, or um, interrupt me if needs be. 
So we're, we've got a very practical course today. And so I'm gonna talk about change points in the context of two R packages. Um, so there's the change point and the change point .np. So the change point package contains the, the li likelihood based approaches and the change point .np is NPs for non-parametric. Okay, so we're gonna use both of those packages today. And um, they should already be inside the, um, the uh, RStudio cloud environment that, that um, the team have, have thankfully set up. And um, I believe it's, it's all up and running now. So please get that link um, from the chat. These are not the only two change point packages um, in, inside uh, available for R. Um, the other common ones that might be useful to you might be struct change um, for changes in regression. Although on the next call, I, I will talk about uh, um, one of our packages for changes in regression as well. Uh, BCP, if you want to do Bayesian change point analysis, there isn't actually much Bayesian stuff around on, on CRAN for change points. And um, this is the most comprehensive one. Um, and the most uh, mature one as well. So, oh, fun, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you for trying that, Lisa. Um, hopefully one of the um, team will be able to pick up that and make sure there's, there's packages available for when we get to that point. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so then we've got the CPM for online changes. Um, we do have a change point online package, which is on GitHub at the moment, but um, it's not ready for CRAN just yet. Um, and then MCPT, which I'll also talk about um, in the next um, more advanced one, where that's looking at mean trends and AR1 and AR2 structure as well now. Okay. So these are the packages that we're going to be using. So the change point and change point .np today, and we'll look at some of these others um, in the next session. So let's talk about how we actually model this now. Okay, so we've kind of talked conceptually about what change points are. Let's get now get down into the nitty gritty of how do we actually do this? Okay, so there are many different distributions and different models that, that we can um, discuss. And um, all of these can be formulated in exactly the same way as I'm going to run through today. Okay, so I'm gonna run through examples for, for a normal distribution um, with a mean that is changing. So the means dependent on time. So that's my, my theta t here. And then I'm going to assume that the variance is one. Okay. This assumption of variance one is very crucial in the packages and I'll, I'll kind of bring that up um, later. Okay. So these, these theta t are going to be piecewise constants. This is how we're going to get our change points. And we're going to look just at a single change point to start with. Okay. We'll move on to multiple change points later. If you're not working with a normal distribution, you're working with some other type of distribution, you can just, you know, um, kind of replace that normal assumption with another distributional assumption. That's absolutely fine. Okay. Um, going going forwards, um, the key is just deciding what parameter is changing. Okay. So we're going to start off with this change in mean. We're going to come to some others later, um, but I just want to make a note at this stage that you can do this with any distribution. So if, if we kind of simulate one example here, we've, we've got a mean of one for the first 150 and then a mean of zero afterwards, okay? And this change point is really, really obvious, okay? This is a really obvious change of size one. And um, when we're working with a, um, a variance of, of one here, um, the size change that, that we can detect reliably is um, we can, so within 200 length data where the change is at 100, um, we can detect a size change of 0.7 with 80% power. So the longer you have either side of the change point, the more power you will have to, to, to be able to detect um, a smaller change, okay? So this is one of the crucial things. If you've got short data, then your changes need to be larger. If you've got longer segments, then your changes can be, can be smaller um, from that point of view, okay? So the way that we model this is we, we literally, so I'm gonna talk in terms of costs, okay? And by costs, um, you can think of that in different ways. You can think of that as likelihoods or loss functions or any measure of fit that, that you think is appropriate for your data, okay? So we're gonna split this up and we're gonna say it's the cost of this segment here up to the change point and the cost of this segment here after the change point is my fit for the whole data. 
So a crucial assumption that we're making when we're doing this splitting up into these two different um, costs for, for each individual segment is that the, um, the model before the, ch the change point and the model after the change point are independent, okay? So if we don't have that independence assumption, maybe you, you want to say, you know, that the mean on this side is a function of the mean on this side. And um, if you're wanting to put in that kind of constraint, then you can't do this, this splitting up like this, okay? What we're assuming here is that the parameters that we're going to be estimating and the, the data on this side is independent of the data on this side. And that allows us to do this summing up as, as we go forwards. When, when we're looking at dependent data, maybe like an AR1 process, then we're going to have a little bit of dependency across, across this boundary here. But provided that um, our segments are, are sufficiently long, this single data point isn't going to actually influence anything um, you know, as, asymptotically. And so we can still do that split up. But the key thing is that, that what, if our parameters on this side and this side are dependent, then we can't do this. Okay? So it's only if, if they're independent, we can split it up into this cost before, cost after, and that gives us the, the cost for the whole data. Okay? And so that's precisely what we do under the hood. So under the hood of all of these functions, all it's doing is splitting it up into a cost for each individual segment and adding them together. Okay? The key thing is, how do we know that, that it's this part plus this part, okay? So we don't know that. And so there's a little video here. Um, I can't play it because I'm on Linux, um, but this is, this is just a, a little video that kind of shows you what we're doing under the hood. And um, so there's 499 places that you could put a change point within, a single change point within this length of 500 data. And all this video does is it shows you as you go forward through time and um, where the change point is. So the change point is gonna move from left to right all the way through all of those different options. And then these red lines are just plotting the mean um, of the before change and after change. So you don't, you don't really see the before change on this first one here. Um, but you'll see straight away that because this segment is longer, even though we've got this change point here, the mean is dragged towards um, this segment because this has more influence um, than, than this portion of the, um, don't say more influence. And um, this is more data than, than there is here. So therefore the mean isn't between the two, it's, it's um, more towards the second segment. But when you can play the video in your own time, and as, as this kind of moves through here, you'll see those means kind of balance out um, to be the two segment means as you get closer and closer to the change point. And then as you go past the change point, it then starts to, you know, normalize the other way where it will start to come. So as you get towards the change point, this mean goes up. Uh, sorry, th this mean comes down slightly because you've got less and less influence of this. And then equally the other side, the, the mean there will start off high and it, it will come down a little bit. And then as you go past the change point, you've got um, the opposite effect coming through of, of the, the first half um, being dragged down as you get more and more contamination from this side. Okay. And so what that kind of looks like here, so this, this plot here is just this fit for the whole data. So I'm just plotting the fit for the whole data, which is the cost of the before plus the cost of the after. And what we see is that the, you know, the overall fit is poor. And then as, as your means kind of get closer to the true means, um, as you know, as the change point moves towards the center, this that this fit then becomes better. Okay, and so for those of you who are thinking, oh, surely this should be a peak rather than a trough here, because you're increased, you, you know, you're getting a better fit. And um, what we use inside change point analysis is, is we use the the negative log likelihood. So we want to minimize our our cost, um, which is in turn maximizing the fit. Okay, so if, if we're talking about fit, it's, you know, maximizing. And um, if, we're, if we're talking about cost, then, then, then we're wanting to minimize it. Um, so this is minimized at 150, which is the true change point location um, here. Depending on the data, it may have been slightly to the left or slightly to the right. But when, when we have um, um, a, you know, you can kind of see here, there's a couple of data points where you're there like, oh, should they be in you know where should the change point be because we, we've got kind of this data point here and you kind of think well 
the you know that clearly could be from the second um, distribution, but those ones in between, it's not clear which distribution they should be from. Okay, so there's a bit of uncertainty as to as to where the change point location should be, and that kind of comes through here with the sense that that this does have a peak at 150, but arguably there's not much difference between um, a lot of those options around that peak there. Okay, but it's clearly different from from you know options um, way away from from that change point location. So this is what we like to see. We like to see a peaked um, distribution here because then it's really obvious where the change points are. As the change point size gets smaller, this is no longer going to be peaked um, as, as much. Um, the, the width is going to increase here and thing. Yeah, temp, that, that's just the name of what I called the vector when I simulated it. <laughs> um, if, if, if you look in the R Markdown document, um, it's, it's um, just that, that I've called, called it temp. <laughs> Because I'm really, really bad at doing the, these things. Rather than putting, so I wanted to keep keep the R code really clean inside the Markdown document. Um, so I haven't like changed axis labels and things like that because I kind of feel that um, those would um, decrease the the understanding of the R code that's in there. So have a, have a look at the R code and hopefully it's it's easy to understand. So. You might think, OK, well, this this is peaked and I've been saying that, well, if the change is smaller, the peak's less obvious. So it may be, you know, how do we know if that peak is significant or not? OK, so how do we know that this um, this value here of one uh, just, you know, just under 140? And um, how do we know that that is the, you know, the, a better fit than having no change point at all? So when, when we're looking at single change points, we do have an asymptotic distribution of the null test statistic. Um, but part of the issue I found with that is that that is an asymptotic result. And so if our, um, if our data is um, either has small um, samples either side or uh, of the change or it maybe doesn't quite fit the assumptions of the normal distribution or things like that. That asymptotic um, distribution can not, you know, not be um, well. It's not valid because the the model that you're using is is only an approximation to the to the true model, and um, that the data was generated from. But I find it's very very sensitive to that. So in general, I, I would I would not advocate using um, asymptotic distributions for um, these deciding if a change point um, is significant or not. Um, some people, I'm ha very happy to have a discussion on that, um, but the rate of convergence to that asymptotic distribution is slow and often real data doesn't actually satisfy our assumptions. So therefore that asymptotic distribution is gonna be even more, you know, more wrong. If, if you can be more wrong than wrong. Um, so um, I would always advocate using an information criteria. And so that kind of balances the differences between the number of change points that you can fit. So it would look at, well, what's the difference between the null, um, so the null, um, so where there's no change point, what's the difference in the cost there versus the cost of the best change point? So I, I probably should have said that when, when we're here. So we only pick one point as the best and the best is, is the lowest uh, in this setting. So we would pick which is the best. That's kind of like taking the minimum over all the possible change point locations. And um, for those of you who kind of have a background in um, likelihood estimation and fitting models using likelihoods, uh, the reason why we have to do this is because um, our change point location is a discrete parameter. And so you can't, um, you know, you can't differentiate the likelihood because you have discrete parameter values. So you can't differentiate um, that. So we have to kind of calculate the um, conditional likelihood. So, so we kind of say the, the likelihood conditional on the change point at this location is this, and then we maximize or, or minimize over all of those um, potential locations. So that's what we're doing here. Um, so, when we use a, an information criteria, there are many different information criteria that we can look at. 
Um, the MBIC um, has been shown to work in a large range of situations. Um, that is the default that I have advocated inside the change point package. Um, it's very, very difficult to say what is large enough, depending on the type of data that you have and the size and everything like that. So as I've been saying before, the more data you have, the smaller a change you can look at. But is that smaller change actually important for the application that, that, you, that you want? You know, as, as we kind of say, you know, the change point might be significant from a statistical perspective, but it's not meaningful from a, you know, from a medical perspective or, or, a, um, or a health perspective. Um, you know, and you can just look at, you know, cancer rates and things like that for, for prime examples of where things are um, statistically significant, but not practically um, useful. Uh, so, um, yeah, so, so this is kind of the same analogy for, for change point analysis. How large is large enough to say there's a change point there? So in, in um, this course, we'll kind of be talking through some of the different options, but I say a good starting point is the MBIC, and I'll show you um, some um, details later for, for how we can kind of look at a range of different values um, and pick which is the best based, based on our, our data set. Okay. So there's kind of some more later on that. Um, so now more about the, the change point package. I'm aware that, you know, I've been talking for almost an hour now. <laughs> so, so we need a break. So, so we're gonna come up on a break shortly. So the change point package has three different, um, what I call wrapper functions. So these are the only three functions um, plus the kind of plotting and, and other things that are important. Um, so we have CPT mean, which does mean changes, CPT var, which is variance changes, and then mean var does mean and variance. All of the functions have the same structure. So I'll cover the structure for the change uh, CPT mean, and then um, I'll cover the differences as we go through the other ones. So it also contains functions. So we use S4 classes, but I have, um, so if you're familiar with those, that's the at symbol rather than the, the dollar. Um, and then, um, so I also have accessor and generator functions and replacement functions for all of those. So if you don't, if you're not familiar with S4 classes, don't worry, you don't have to be. Um, it will be very, hopefully very clear as we go through how you can use the package without having any knowledge of what the class structure is whatsoever. There's five data sets in the package as well, some of which we're going to, we're going to use today. Um, and then there's, if you do know what you're doing in terms of um, kind of, um, creating models and wanting to find change points for models that are not here, then there are other functions that are inside the package that will allow you to put in your own uh, cost function and things like that. So for different models, so we can talk about those later. Uh, so Oscar said, you mentioned earlier that with 100 points, we could identify a mean shift of 0.7. Uh, will we cover how to compute that kind of conclusion? Um, so we won't hear, this is kind of, um, this is done by simulation. So this is kind of the rules of thumb um, for change point analysis in, in that setting. That I mean, I say rules of thumb, that they're, they're based on um, uh, simulation settings where you, simula you simulate a bunch of different data sets with different mean shift sizes. And then you look at the, the power versus the false alarm rate um, for different test statistics. So I, I've just covered that, so the 0.7, is um, a general rule of thumb for when you have 100 either side, the change points in the middle. So that's the most powerful location for the change point to be because you've got equal sample sizes on both sides. Um, and I'm just kind of saying that as a general rule of thumb and um, kind of think about to yourself, well, that change size that's been detected there is you know, 0.5 and I have 30 data points either side really is that going to be something that I want to have a lot of confidence in? Um, so this is kind of starting to try and get some intuitions of the small sizes that, that we're looking at. And um, if we get change points that are small, then we need to question ourselves more. I'll cover in two weeks time um, the influence package, which will uh, is a brand new one. It's like hot off the shelf. And um, we're just finishing writing the paper for that. And that will really help you in terms of diagnosing what is important features of your data. So I'll cover that in, in the second session when I'm hoping to have the package on CRAM by then. 
Um, okay, so the S4 class itself, so the class is called CPT and there's different slots. The design of the class is such that when you have done an analysis, you only need to store the output object from the CPT function. Um, and that output object will contain your data and everything that you have set um, from your um, the initial call to the function such that you could reproduce the analysis just from that object. So that's my aim. So you don't have to kind of have um, a knowledge of, oh, well, which version of the data did I use? Had I standardized anything? You know, that sort of stuff. Um, so the idea is once you've got that object out of the, the CPT, um, I'm going to say CPT functions, I mean the CPT mean, CPT var, CPT mean var. Um, once you've got an output from, the, from those functions, that is a fully reproducible object. Okay. Um, inside that, so I said um, you don't need to know about the class structure. So the way that we do that is that every class, um, sorry, every slot inside the S4 class has a function to access it. Um, so you can do CPTSX, which will get the change points from the object X. Okay. We've got methods such as plot and summary, which we'll use. And there's additional generic functions such as like seg.len. So that's going to get you segment lengths. Um, so again, you can use that on an object X and ncpts, which is number of change points. Again, you, you, these are for use on a, on a change point object. Okay. So let's kind of delve into actually using one of these functions so that we can have, have a break and have a go ourselves. So the CPT mean function here is going to take some data. This data here can be a vector. I've put vector or TS objects. So if you've got time series object, let me just put my power on. Um, so you, you can have a vector or time series object. You can equally put in a matrix. Um, but if you do put in a matrix, it's going to assume that each row is a different time series. So that's different from um, some other kind of um, kind of time series stuff where they may look at each column. I kind of come fr from it from the, the time aspect is always on the X axis. Therefore the time aspect is always the columns in, in your matrix. That's kind of how I think um, the time always goes across the bottom and then the, the other things go, go up the, um, x-axis. So um, it's very, very clear in, in the um, help file for that. So, but we're going to be dealing with vectors um, or TS objects today. Um, so um, that's kind of where I'm coming from there. The penalty is essentially this cutoff value. So it says, how much of an improvement do you need to be to actually say that a change point exists? So this is kind of um, from, you know, from the um, previous analysis. So, so it's either, so if you're going zero change points to one change point, you would say, well, the difference between our, our fit for a zero change point model and a one change point model needs to be larger than this value. Okay. So there's lots of penalties in there. As I said, the defaults MBIC, uh, we've got the Swartz information criterion, Bayesian information criterion, AIC. I want to be really, really clear about this now. AIC should never be used for change point analysis. It is the worst test statistic ever. We have shown that asymptotically it picks the wrong number of change points. It is there purely because some people insist on using AIC when it is absolutely the wrong thing to do. So you'll get a warning if, or you should get a warning if you put the AIC in. Um, if not, it may be in the, the, the um, GitHub version that I haven't pushed a CRAN yet. Um, but yeah, never use the AIC. You, you may be kind of conditioned from, you know, other types of analysis and statistics that AIC works really well or AICC and um, don't use it for change points ever. Um, Hanan Quinn, um, I, I've talked about the um, asymptotic already and then there's manual so that you can actually just specify this just yourself, okay? And the penalty value there, so pen dot value here, um, if you want to put in asymptotic, then this pen dot value is your type one error. So typically 0 0.05 and um, it can be a number if you're using the manual setting um, or a character as well. So you can have it as a character that can be evaluated using some of the, um, um, some of the elements from the test statistic. Um, if you 
want to do that sort of thing, then the help file kind of tells you what you can and can't use there. And so the method, so AMOC is at most one change. So that is what that stands for. And that's what we've kind of been discussing so far. I'll talk about these other options, Peltzegne and Binseg, um, when we move on to multiple changes. Um, and then the test statistic for CPT mean is either normal, which is the um, normal distribution, or a QSUM. Um, these two are um, equivalent um, because um, they, you know, you can take one and transform it into the other for the single change point case. Um, so it, it really doesn't matter which one which one of these you use. They have dis different asymptotic values. So if you are using the asymptotic test statistic, you may get slightly different results. Um, but for the a lot of people like QSUM because it was kind of that's come from the process control setting where you set a boundary and, and so that's why it's in there so that people know that it's there if it needs to. And then class here. So this is do we want to return one of those CPT class objects? The default is true. Um, if not, you just get a, an output that just says where the change point is. And then parameter estimates. So if, if you're really not interested in the parameter estimates, you can set that to false. That will save a little bit of time, especially if you're working on really, really large data sets. And then min seg len, this is the minimum number of data points between changes. So by default for cpt.mean, it's the smallest, um, uh, the smallest distance between the two change points. So that's one because we're just estimating one parameter, which is the mean value, okay? So if your application, um, you know, would warrant that, you know, if you're going to have those changes of length one, you just tell it, well, they're not really there. That couldn't possibly happen. You can use that min seg len to increase um, the distance between the change points. So say, you know, for example, um, you might be working on some data whereby uh, you're looking at monthly observations and you really think, you know, there's no changes that are going to take place on less than a yearly scale. So you could set that min seg length to be 12 and then you won't get change points that are closer together than 12 observations. Okay. So um, Siddhartha has, has said, what makes AIC a poor criteria? So the reason why AIC is a poor criteria is because um, it's, so it's literally just twice the number of parameters that we're estimating. And so, as, as you estimate more change points, you're estimating more um, um, parameters, um, but that two times is just not strong enough, okay? You need, you need a higher um, difference to, to say that that change is truly there. And so this is, this is where the AIC will always give you more change points than are really in the data. So, asymptotically because that doesn't grow um, appropriately as n grows you basically need you need a criteria that is going to grow with n because as you get more data points the values that you're getting in your fit will be changing more Does that, I don't know if that makes sense but because because you you've got more values in within each of your segments your, the values that you're dealing with for the fits are naturally larger. And so you need the some a penalty that scales with the number of check, sorry, with the length of your data to control that an AIC doesn't. Okay. And then C Tate said, um, oh, yeah, thanks, Jamie. <laughs> um, I um sorry. Could you re-describe what a penalty is? Okay, so yeah, Jamie's kind of taken that if you need that. Um, good, okay. Okay, good. Um, yeah, keep the questions coming. Um, Jamie will answer some and, and I can pick some up if, if needed be. Okay, so this is kind of the structure of, of there. And I wanted to stress at this point, so the cpt.mean function assumes that the variance of your time series is one. The reason why it does that is because if, if it doesn't, then you need to estimate the variance of your time series. And estimating the variance, so if, if you remember, a variance is calculated as a deviation from the mean. Okay. Um, and so if you don't know what your mean is because you might have change points, then you can't calculate your variance in the traditional sense. Okay. You can try and calculate um, a robust variance that might be robust to 
the change points being present. Um, but I have not found a consistently good method of estimating that variance in the presence of, cha of change points that works in a large range of scenarios. So I am not comfortable adding a method to my CPT mean function that will control that or estimate that variance because your any analysis will be dependent on how you estimate that variance. And so I'm not comfortable that I, there's something that will work in all scenarios. So I would prefer, and this is why I do, I have it set so that it assumes it is one and I expect the user to deal with how to estimate that variance appropriately prior to putting um, their data into um, the CPT mean function. Okay. So this is really, really crucial. Um, if, you, if, if your variance is smaller than one, what that means is that you won't find change points um, when you should do. And if your variance is larger than one, then it means you'll find more change points than you should do. Okay, so if there's some kind of wiggle room around one where close to one, you're not going to get any difference. But if, if you go, you know, much lower than one or much higher than one, then it affects your analysis in two very different ways. Okay. So here we've just got an example of how we use the, the CPT mean function. So I'm setting my seed so it's reproducible for, for you all. Um, I'm just going to simulate 100 observations here from a normal distribution with mean zero and variance one and then another 100 from a mean of five. So if you remember what I said, 0.7 had power of, of point, um, 0.8. So this is gonna be a really obvious change going from zero to five and um, 100 observations with a mean of five and again, the variance of one. And then I'm just using the C to concatenate those two together. So it's just literally two piecewise things stuck together. And then I just use a cpt.mean function. The default here, um, is the MBIC penalty with the at most one change uh, with the normal test statistic. So that's what this is doing here. So I'm just putting my data in as a vector, and then I can use CPTS on that output, which is m1.amoc here, and that will give me the change point, which is at 100, which is what we expect because we have 100 observations and then it changes. Okay. Similarly, we can do plot on that object as well. And then that's going to give me um, a time series plot here with the mean already superimposed on it. This is the estimated mean. You can see that change is really, really obvious here. And the, there's no way that we should get that um, wrong because there's no observations kind of around this that would um, kind of mean those two distributions were overlapping, okay? And um, for who was asking about the, the data set. So this is the default. So by default, this will this is always going to be on the y axis and the x axis is time, but I've kind of increased it so that you can see more of the plot here. But this is the default that's on there. You can use so inside the plot, you can use all of the all of your standard um, scaling for um, titles and, and axes and removing axes and changing your, your labels and um, they're all able to be included in this plot command here um, with additional um, plotting variables of cpt.width, which is um, going to change the width of these lines here, and also cpt.col, which will change the color of those lines as well. So those are kind of two additional plotting parameters. Okay. Right. So I'm going to kind of take a break there and give you a task to do. So on, on the GitHub page, there is uh, this GP visits week, uh, November 17, 18. So this is um, a year's worth of data from November 17 to the end of October 18. And um, that is just the number of GP visits. I've just done this as um, across um, England here. And so this is just the number of GP visits across England. So this is our time series here. And the question that I want you to answer is, is there a change, okay? And we're going to use the CPT mean function to look at that. Okay. So I've just done a, a TS plot here just to, just to show you what the data looks like. So I'm going to encourage all of you to take some time away from the screen now and um, go and grab a coffee um, and then come back and have a go at trying to analyze uh, this GP visits data. And um, 
I'm going to disappear and get a coffee. And when I come back, Jamie's going to disappear and get a coffee. That's all right, Jamie. So depending on which way around you want to do it, you can kind of have a look at this first and then go on to um, have a break or you can do it the other way around. And I just want you to kind of post in the chat when you've finished analysing this. Um, I'm going to give you till, you know, just after 11 o'clock to have the break and do a quick analysis of this. If you've got any issues um, with doing this analysis, um, Jamie, can you post the, the GitHub link again? Um, if you've got any issues with doing this analysis um, or anything like that, you've got any problems with the R Studio Cloud or anything, um, if you just put, if you just raise your hand, we'll be monitoring for raised hands in the chat, and then we'll take you off into a breakout room um, with either Jamie or myself, and then hopefully we can share screens and um, solve the issue in the breakout room where we can kind of talk to each other uh, from there. Okay. So if anybody has any issues, let me know. Um, if not, um, we'll come back together just after 11 o'clock. Thanks everyone. Hopefully everybody's um, back. So it was really interesting to see in the chat that, that most people at the beginning got a change point at 14. And so when, when we look at this data, data set here, um, what, what do people kind of, what do people see? What do people see? Um, do people think there should be a change point? Um, feel free to unmute yourself and join in the conversation. Don't really see a change point. I suspect there's a, a rare observation, a, a low observation at 13. Um, yeah, so this, this one here. And then yeah. there's also one over here as well, isn't there? On, on the other side, just after about 45-ish. Okay. Yeah. So that's interesting. Yeah, so so if we also look at look at this kind of y-axis here, these numbers are, are quite large. Okay. We're talking about number of GP visits across the whole of all of the UK. We're not talking about small numbers here. And so when you know if if we're looking here, so so this this part here is um is oh it's like three million, and then you know, this point here is uh, six million. So you know, you you're kind of looking at, at numbers here that are vary quite a lot so this this lower bound here is just under three million this upper bound here is way over six million so we're not talking about a variance one situation are we so if we oh, oh that's my task one um yeah i forgot to say don't forget to library change point before you start um so if we just do the default cpt.mean on the original data then we're going to find that change point of 14 okay and so that's what a lot of people did. They just did CPT mean on the original data. You got your change points and, and we got the value of 14. And that's clearly, um, may, may, maybe it's less clear to some people, but this, this is kind of motivated by this observation here coming through. And we'll use the same data set tomorrow to look at the influence of those observations. Uh, sorry, not tomorrow, next week, um, in two weeks time in the next course. So we can, we can look at the parameter estimates here. So this is going to give us um, a list and the list starts um, with, um, so dollar mean gives you the mean estimates. When we look at mean var, you'll get the mean estimate and the variance estimate as well here. And so here you, you see there's, there's a huge difference there between those two means. And so you think, oh, wow, there's a huge difference between those means of those two segments. Maybe there's something there. But what we forgot to do was to scale our data. Okay, so this is the plot. So if we just do plot of that, this is what you would have got for a change in mean of 14. You know, if you look at the scale of the data that we're looking at here, that mean doesn't look too large. And you do kind of start to question, you know, is it being pulled by this observation here? Because it's just straight afterwards. And um, it seems along this line here as well, you, you know, you've got more observations below than you have above. So, you know, does that really look like that's that should be there or not? And your gut reaction from the original view of the data was that doesn't look like a change in mean to me. Well, at least that was mine anyway. So I'm, I'm going to scale like this. Steven's put, put some code here that, that scales um, um, his variance um, here. Um, so he's scaled by the variance. Um, oh, to the, to the half. So yes, yeah, the star star is, is um, to the power. So here, so, so you've got um, the square root of the variance uh, or the standard deviation. So here, here you could have just used SD to get the standard deviation. Um, and then he scaled that, and then he's done the, the CPT mean there. 
Okay, so here I've just used this, the scale function, so that centers it as well as um, 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 standardizing uh, to variance one. And then this scale function there will, will return a matrix uh, in the wrong um, direction in the sense that it returns a column matrix. And if you remember what I said before, um, if, if there's a matrix, it assumes each row is a different data set. So I'm just going to use as.vector to, to change that um, uh, one dimensional matrix into, into back into a vector. Okay. And then when we use change points on that, then we get no change points. Okay. So it's, it's always good to remember with where we're using the cpt.mean function that we should always scale our data first, just to make sure that um, that variance is, is one or, or close to one um, across, the, across the whole data, okay? So using this scale function, this isn't a robust way to scale. I'm not saying that this is the best way to do it. Um, personally, what I tend to do is I tend to take a windowed estimate of the variance using a window size of 30, because 30 is when you start to get some asymptotics starting to kick in for a normal distribution. Um, I, I will change that depending on the data set I'm working with, but usually I would take a, a window size of around 30, uh, roll that through the data, and then take the, take the variance within e each of those segments through the data. And then I would take the median of those, because if you take the mean, then the segment that includes that change in mean, um, is going to produce a really spurious estimate of the variance because the variance is going to be much larger for all of those windows that take into account that have that ch change in mean in there and so you don't want to be taking the mean of those variance estimates because it's going to be pulled away from the truth whereas taking a median will give you a, a better estimate so i've used scale here just because i didn't want to you know type in the the code for doing this windowed estimate and confuse you guys as to what I was doing. So scale in, in, in this example works quite well because we've got just one change point and it's not uh, the, you know, it's, it's um, the way that that scale function works. Um, it's not gonna be distorted too much. So that does produce something close to, close to a variance of one in the, across each segment. Um, but the original variance, um, sorry, the original variance here is much far away from one because of the size of the, of the, um, because of the range of the data points that we have here. And so that is going to give you more change points than you would naturally be expecting, okay? So this scale brings it down um, that variance. And so we're then getting no change points, which is what our gut instinct would have told us originally. So we always need to kind of be aware of, always look at the data whenever you can. Some, sometimes you've just got too much to be able to look at it and we'll deal with the, what to do then um, uh, in two weeks time as well when we're looking at more complicated scenarios. Um, but where you can always look at the data. I tend to not use the CPT mean function very much as well, which is also why I'm not really bothered about the, the assumption of the variance of being one, because in my experience, most practical applications, when you have a change in mean, you will always have a change, you know, you often have a change in variance as well. So I tend to use a CPT mean var function as my default rather than the CPT mean here. Um, okay, so that was kind of the single change point scenario that we we're talking about. So let's now move on to look at multiple change points. Okay, so here is, is a data set where, um, you know, it appears like we might have multiple um, changes in mean here. Um, just to kind of get um, a feeling, get people you know, revved up for multiple change points, where do we think the changes might be in, in this data set? Anyone? Twenty and fifty, yeah, thanks Stephen. Anyone else? Lisa? Yeah. 30? Thanks, Tom. 90? Yeah, good. Okay, so we're getting quite a few in. Um, so th hopefully this one at the end um, is a bit more obvious. That's quite a larger change. That's going from 2 down to um, about 0.5. Um, and then, oh, maybe one at 70. Yeah, that's interesting because 
that's a good spot there, Lisa, because you've got the, the 70, you're kind of looking, maybe that, that little bit there is just above two and maybe this mean is just below two, maybe, who knows? Maybe that's variability. It's really hard to see, especially in these shorter data sets. No, notice how we're only at 100 observations here. Um, oh, sorry, Stephen, confused about CPT mean bar. Um, I will cover this, Stephen, when, when we move on to the mean var function, okay? Um, that is a question. It's an interesting question, and if I don't remember to cover it when we get to the mean var function, then do pull me up again. Um, but hopefully, um, I'll remember to cover that when, when we move to that section, okay? Um, so, yeah, so here, it's not clear there whether, whether it is a change in mean or not. We've not got many observations there, so it could just be variability, but, but this... It does kind of look like this might be a bit of a lower segment here than, than it is here. Um, and then maybe at the beginning, that, that kind of, it could be a linear trend there, couldn't it? Because that, that does look like you've got higher observations here coming down. It's not, um, I should say, it's not been simulated that way. But it, it's just kind of a, a reminder that this isn't always easy, even, even when we're looking at uh, multiple change points. And the question there as well is how many change points? So you can see maybe two obvious ones, this kind of one around 50 here and this one around 90. Um, and quite a lot of you picked up this one at 20 here. Um, you're picking round numbers because, you know, they're simulated close to round numbers, but, you know, it could be 21. <laughs> we, we'd, we'd look into it further, but yeah, roughly around 20, around 50 and around 90. And there's question marks as to, as to whether there's any more in there. So, so as kind of Lisa pointed out, it might be one at 70. Um, so yeah, so that's good. So the problem that with our kind of scenario so far, so again, this, this will work for you um, if, if you're on Windows, is when we're looking at a single change point, if you remember, I said we look at every single option for where the change point location is and look at the cost either side, add them together and, and kind of plot that, that curve um, or whether that's what's going on, uh, looking for the minimum, that's what's going on in the code in the background. Um, so, if, if we're kind of in this scenario, we, we don't know the number of change points and we don't know where the change point locations are. So if we kind of look at that, for this data set of 100 data points, there's 4,851 different options for two change point locations, okay? So if you remember that there would be 99 for the single change point location, 4,851 for two change points. For three change point locations, you're going to be looking at even more options there. And we don't know how many change points there are. So again, th this video will just go through and just show you the means for the two change options. So you can see there's two vertical red lines here. So it will just show you all of those different 4,851 options on, on the change point. Okay. So the question here when we're looking at multiple change points is, where are the change points? How many there are? But if we're, if we're looking at a data set of length n, then there's two to the n minus one possible solutions for that problem when we don't know where the number, what the number of change points is. So if we've, even, even in n over 100, that's two to 99 different options. And a lot of the data sets these days are getting much larger. You know, we may have data sets in the, in the millions, um, et cetera. So that, that just is not feasible to look at. If you know the number of change points, then there's still n minus one choose m solutions. Okay, so just to kind of put that in context. If n is 100 and we know there's 10 change points, that is 2.6 times 10 to the 23 different solutions that we would have to check. So you can imagine that, you know, the single change point scenario is quite well known. We can look at that quite concretely, can search all of the different options, but in the multiple change point scenario, that's just not feasible, okay? So the question is, how do we do that efficiently? How do we find the one, you know, the best set of, you know, the number and the location of change points within that data set in a, in a time efficient manner and computationally efficient manner? So there's three different um, kind of options here. So we've already covered at most one change. So that's kind of what, what we've looked at already. The other options that I said were in change point were binary segmentation, segment neighborhoods, and uh, PELT, okay? So binary segmentation is a very conceptually simple um, method. 
um, but it provides an approximate solution. So what binary segmentation does is it takes the at most one change method and applies that sequentially. So what I mean by that is that you'll take your whole data, you apply the at most one change method, you find where a change point is. When you found that change point, conditional on that change point, so you fix that change point location, you look at the data beforehand and afterwards and have two separate further analyses where you use the at most one change method on both sides. If you find change points in either of those, you keep further segmenting your data um, wherever you find those change points. Okay, So that's an approximate method because when we've set that first change point location, we can't move it. So if you, you know, you could probably think of an example where if that gets put in the wrong place, that then means that ones that come after that may also get put in the wrong place or may not be found because that first one was in the wrong place. So wrong place could mean like completely way off or, you know, where a, chain, where a tree change point isn't, or it could mean, you know, close to, but not exactly um, where the change point is. So it's computationally fast because, you know, you're just running this AMOT method, which is, you know, N minus one, for, for a change in mean and minus one options per time you run it. Um, and that comes out as order n log n in terms of computational time. Okay. So that's kind of the approximate method, but we can use um, a technique called dynamic programming to solve the um, problem of finding the optimal um, number and location of change points exactly. Um, there's two different ways to do that binary segment, uh, sorry, that dynamic programming. One is to search for the, for the best one change point and then build on that for the best two change points, but in an exact way where you can move uh, the change point locations. Uh, that's the segment neighborhood method. So that's order QN squared, where Q is the maximum number of change points that, that you'll um, look for, because you're kind of building from one up. Um, and then there's the alternative method, which is kind of a sequential search. So that's where you find um, the last change point location. And as you move through time, you're only really caring about the last change point location. Um, because if you know where the last change point location is, then when you were at that last change point location, you know where the one prior to that is. And so you can kind of work backwards to find them all. So that's um, the method that's implemented that does that is the PELT, which is pruned exact linear time. So that gives you an exact segmentation um, it using this prune dynamic programming approach um, and it has linear computational time um, under certain circumstances. So at worst it's order n squared, which can be really, really bad um, if n is large. Um, but for if if you have if you use one of the penalties that, that we've kind of looked at, so the MBIC by the default, and if you have change points that are kind of roughly spread throughout your data then you'll get an order n. So the computational time for that relies on this fact that what it's doing is as you go through the data, um, you're, you're always looking where the last change point is. So say, say you're at time 100, the locations for the last change point are all the way from one up to 100. Um, so that's how the dynamic programming side works. So instead of you know having um, keeping track of all of the change point locations, you just keep track of the last change point. So you'd have 100 places to look. What this pruned aspect does is says which of those 100 are more, more likely. And so it will get rid of ones that are less likely um, as, as we kind of go through. So, so when we're at, say when we're at time point 50, from one to 50, if there's a change point at 30 and it's a really obvious change point, then nothing prior to 30 will ever be considered again. It'll always be 30 onwards, looking for where the last change point is. So then when you get to a time point 100, instead of having to look at um, one to 100, if the last change point was at 30, then you'll have to look at, it won't be 30 to 100, but you'll have to look at 30 plus some ones afterwards, because some of them will still drop out, even though there's no true change point there. So you can imagine then, why, why if you have regular change points through your data, you're regularly kind of getting rid of loads of different options for, for where your change point, where your last change point location could be. 
And so this is where, why we're saying it's at worst order n squared, because at worst, you've got change points that are really far apart and you're not getting rid of options. So that pruning part doesn't actually work very efficiently. Um, but if you've got change points that are kind of at regular points through your data, I'm really talking about longer data sets here when, when we're talking about this. Um, then if, you, if you've got you know, points regularly through the data, then you'll regularly be getting rid of lots of locations. And so the number that you have to check is always going to be very small. And um, if you've got regular changes through your data, we can prove that that number it has a limit and therefore um, the scaling is order n. Okay. In practice, you obviously want to look at how long is it going to take to analyze your data? How important is it to you that you get exact an exact solution versus an, an approximate solution? Um, and kind of balance those things off. Um, but I would encourage you to, to give Pell a, a try. Um, not only is it um, pretty fast, um, you know, so I have analyzed data that is larger than, uh, so what we're we looking at, we're looking at 3 million length data with change points roughly every kind of couple of hundred thousand um, and Pelt analyzed that 3 million data in, in less than a minute. So, you know, if you've got regular change points, then it's going to be fast. Um, I, I've also had, had a one, you know, a 1 million length, which didn't have very obvious change points and that took three minutes. So it really depends on, on how you can do the runtime. Yeah, that's a good point as well. Yeah, so you can impact runtime by doing the minimum segment length as well. Yeah, so the large minimum segment length is also going to get rid of more options as well. So yes, um, it depends. I mean, if you think about it, if if you can't do that pruning aspect, then the minimum segment length is only really going to get rid of a small number because it's only going to be related to okay. If I'm t if I'm at time point one hundred and my minimum segment length is ten, it's only going to get rid of those ten observations because we're still can well, 10 observations there and 10 observations at the beginning. So the, the bit in the middle from, from 10 to uh, 90 is still going to have to be ran um, if you don't have any, any change points. So it can, it can help, um, especially if you've got lots of change points as well, then the, you know, the balance there between minimum segment length and um, the runtime will be there. Um, but yeah, it, it helps, but it's not... Um, um, it, it's not going to be the deciding factor, I don't think, um, in what goes forwards. Okay. So we're going to move now quickly and consider CPT var and CPT mean var, and then we're going to have um, another break. So for CPT var, it's the same structure as before. Um, we've got the data, the penalty, the penalty value. Um, we've got the method, the Q, which is our maximum number for binary segmentation and also for um, the segment neighborhood. I should say I never recommend using segment neighborhood because um, it is QN squared. <laughs> um, it gives exactly the same answer as PELT does. Um, you will get a warning if you if you try to use it saying that you should really be using PELT um, for that. Uh, it's in there more as a compar comparison in different scenarios um, from an academic perspective. Um, so the test statistic for CPT var. So previously we had for CPT mean it was normal and Q sum. Now we've got normal and CSS. So CSS is cumulative sums of squares. So it's very similar to the um, Q sum distribution, but it's, it's the sums of squares. Um, so it's the non-parametric one, but for um, the um, variance rather than for the mean. Um, we've got no dot mean here. So no dot mean. Um, is basically, do we know the mean, yes or no? So whereas in the um, mean setting, we had to have the variance set at one, to calculate the mean when the variance is changing, it, you know, the variance changing doesn't really impact the estimate of the mean, okay? We don't need to know that the variance is changing or when it's changing to calculate the mean. So the mean is included. You don't have to zero mean this process and then we've got this no dot mean here. So we always assume that we don't know the mean, so it's estimated. But if you do know the mean and you don't, you know, so, so we've got min seg length of two here. And um, if you know the mean, then your min seg length can go down to one because you're only estimating one parameter. So you can put um, no dot mean equals um, true here, and then you can put the mean value in there. And then that will not count it as an estimated parameter for any of the penalties. Um, so the penalties, uh, 
all of them look at how many um, parameters are estimated. And um, the size of the penalty depends on the number of parameters, which is also the number of segments and the number of change points. Um, so knowing the mean here will just reduce your, your penalty slightly from that. And the default's two because um, we are, to, you know, you can't estimate a variance from one observation. Well, the variance is, is zero, so um, yeah. Um, okay, good. Um, so the way that we use that, so I, I've again, I've got I've got multiple change points here. So I'm doing um, they're all length 100 just for, for simplicity. They're all mean zero. They don't have to be as long as they're the same mean. And then we're going from a, a standard deviation of one to two to ten to nine. Okay. And this this is just showing you that. Um, so just as we kind of had the 0.7 for the um, uh, length 200 with the change in the middle rule of thumb, it's the same thing for changes in variance. We have a ratio of, um, of I, I say a ratio of three is the rule of thumb um, for the, for the um, variance. Um, but in, in reality, you know, you can go slightly below that. It's, I think it's like 2.78 or something like that. For, for the, again, the same scenario where you've got 200 length data, the, the changes in the middle. So you've got 100 either side with the different variances. Okay. So again, I'm just using cpt.var here. Uh, I now want to look for multiple changes. So I'm going to change my method. So I'm going to use method as pelt. And here I'm just doing a manual penalty just to show you guys how, how you can do this. And um, this manual penalty that I'm using here is exactly the same as the um, SIC BIC penalty. Um, I should say SIC BIC, they're exactly the same penalty. It's just people know them by different names from different fields. So um, this is saying, because I'm estimating two parameters, um, I'm estimating my um, variance and I'm estimating my change point location. So I'm estimating two parameters per segment and then I'm gonna scale this by, by log n, okay. So this is the penalty that's used for every single segment. So um, previously what we were doing is, is we were, so the cost is still the same. So you've got the cost before the change point, the cost after the change point, and you add them together. The, the way that we decide it, um, whether a change point it should be in is exactly the same way. You kind of add the different costs together from the different segments, and you're looking if the improvement is larger than this penalty value. This is on a per change point basis. So if I'm adding, so say, I, say I'm comparing a one segment with a three segment, then this is going, you know, the one segment would have one lot of this penalty and the three segment would have three lots of this penalty. And that would, you, you kind of subtract the penalties from both of those and say, well, which one's larger after I've subtracted the penalty, okay? Um, so then, Again, we can, we can look at the change points for that. So the change points here are just going to be 101 and 200. So we've got this first one here, but it's at 102. So it's not quite at the 100. I'm going to show you the data in a minute and you might see why. Um, and we've got the 200 one. So that's 100 plus 100. So we've got this one here going between these two segments, but we don't have this change point here between the 10, the variance of 10 and the variance of nine. So if, if you remember, I said that the ratio um, so the ratio of 10 to 9 is much less than 3. So this is just demonstrating that it doesn't always find all the change points. Okay. And then the variances for the segments, we've got 0.8. So that's um, relatively speaking close to 1, um, 3.69, and then 92, because this has been brought down because, um, sorry, I should say, so, so this one here would be 4 because these are the variances, where, whereas the... Um, this is the standard deviation. So two squared is four. So this is 3.69 close to four. And then you've got 92 here, which is somewhere between the, you know, the 100 that we've got here and then the 81 that we've got here. Okay. Okay. So that's, that's kind of the estimates for those. And then the mean is given as well in this parameter S because we're estimating the mean. Okay. So that's the, the mean was zero for this, but it's estimated slightly above zero. Um, okay, so when we look at this, so th this is the output. So again, we just do the plots. So I've, I've put the ratios here. So we've got the ratio of four, two, and then 0.81. And remember, I said the ratio needs to be above three for us to detect it with 80% power with 100 observations either side. So 
I'm plotting it. I've used cpt.width here just to show you that that's an option. And that's changed the width of my of my lines here. And when, when we kind of look, so you, you can have a look at the code in, in the markdown document. If, if you kind of look and zoom in on this area, you'll see that these observations here just after the change point and just before the change point look like they could potentially be from the same distribution. So if you think about it, when we're looking at um, changes in mean, what, what we're doing is, is we've kind of got two distributions. So if there's no change in mean, the distributions are overlapped. And um, as the change in mean kind of increases, then those distributions separate. And as soon as you have like proper separation of those distributions, you will always find the change point in the right place. Okay. When the tails of those distributions overlap, then you can kind of um, get a little bit of ambiguity of points either side, depending on the, you know, the random seed that was used. If you get, you know, an observation that's right in the tail of, of the second distribution, then, and that tail is towards the distribution of the first, then you may find the change slightly later than it actually is because of that overlap with the tails. If you think about a change in variance, what you're doing is you have two distributions with the same mean and all that's changing is the tail behavior. So you, you're just kind of saying, well, is it fatter or is it thicker? The mean's still the same for both distributions. So the distributional overlap is huge when we're looking at these changes in variance, which is why you're going to get more variability in the change point location being detected you know, around, around the truth, okay? And if you look at that, you know, now I've told you there's a change point at 300, you can kind of see that these, these larger observations that, that, we're, that we're seeing here on this side and, and over here on this side aren't in that second half, okay? So you don't see, you're not seeing um, very um, obvious change, you know, now I've told you this, I've simulated a change at 300. You can look at it and you can go, oh yeah, I could see how you could put that in there. I probably wouldn't put it at 300 though. I'd probably put it back here by these two large observations. But there's not enough evidence there to say that there is a change point because it's only in these few observations that are in the tails. Um, there's not enough of a distributional difference in the overlap um, to be able to say that there's a difference between those two. Now, if we had, say, two observation, 200 observations in each segment or 300 or something like that, then maybe we might be able to do that and see the difference. Um, but yeah, um, not at the moment. Uh, so Lisa, yes, discussing assigning probabilities to each potential change point. So the only way that you can assign probabilities to the change points is, in, is if you're using the kind of asymptotic distribution coming through. Um, so I'm not going to talk about assigning probabilities to potential change points. What I will talk about is um, checking your assumptions and looking for stabilities in those change point locations. So in two weeks time, I'm going to kind of look at, look at this and say, well, if I would have had slightly different data, would this change point here have moved very much? So I will talk about that in, in, two, in two weeks time, um, but I won't be talking about assigning probabilities to multiple change point locations because one, it's really, really difficult because if you're trying to say the probability of a change point, you can't say the probability of the individual change point location because if you remove that change point location, then unless you're in the binary segmentation setting, all of the other change points will move to compensate with that. Um, so you, you can imagine that if, if I remove this change point at, at 100 here, um, potentially the change point at 200 could move slightly earlier or slightly later because of that, because the variability in that overall segment will be different, okay? It's a bit less obvious here, but in real data, you, you do find that change points will move around more when you delete a, data, a change point. So if you're kind of saying, right, I've got this segmentation, I've got my segmentation because I've picked either my information criteria or as I'm going to show you later, I've, I've specifically picked my segmentation. You then can't look for the change point, you know, the confidence and um, levels for the change point individually because you've picked it as a segmentation as a whole. You really need to look at one segmentation versus another segmentation. Um, so if you're in the Bayesian context, they tend to, that, that's what they tend to do. They tend to kind of look at at the confidence intervals of segmentations rather than of individual change point locations. Okay, 
So I'm going to do CPG meanwhile, and then we're going to have another break. So again, it's exactly the same as, as structure. Here we've got a choice of um, normal gamma exponential or Poisson, because obviously the, in these distributions, so in exponential and Poisson, uh, you have one parameter, but that one parameter controls both the mean and the variance. So that's why they're here in the CPT mean var. And then the gamma here, we're assuming a shape parameter and the scale parameter is the, is the one that is assumed to change. So the shape is an extra argument here. Um, that you can, it's default is one, you can set that to, to whatever you think is appropriate for um, a gamma distribution. If I've never seen um, a real life application using a gamma distribution. So if you have one, I would be very intrigued. Um, but I'm not going to cover that because I've, I've never seen it in real life. Um, and then again, we've got the min sec length, which is set to two because we're estimating um, the mean and the variance here. So there's two parameters that we're estimating. So we need a minimum length of two here. Okay. And this is again the same. So here I'm going to use an exponential example. So I've got 50 observations in each segment and I'm changing the rate parameter here. And then here I'm, I'm using test.stat to change my uh, test statistic. So as I said, it's normal gamma exponential or pass on. It does do partial matching um, if you're interested in that. And then you've got method is I'm going to use binary segmentation again, just as an example. I'm going to set the maximum number of segments um, to be 10 here. Okay, so change points nine, segments 10. And then my change points here, they're finding the 50, the 100 and the 150 all perfectly for this one. And then our parameter estimates are also close to the tree. So a rate of one, five, two, and seven there. Okay. And that's just a random variation in the seed that's um, getting those variations in the uh, parameter estimates. And notice that it knows that it's an exponential distribution. So it's doing dollar rate because that's the parameter rather than doing dollar mean or dollar variance. Okay. And again, I can just do plot of that value. Uh, I've got CPT width I've used again, and I've also used a CPT col for this one to change the color of those. Um, um, those lines going in just to show you that, that you can. Okay, and so that's that data. So we're now going to look at um, some um, gene genomic data. So this is um, human chromosome one. And this is open source data. The data is contained within the package. So if you just do data HC1, that's within the change point package. Um, and I'd like you, you know, it's quite a long data set here. It doesn't take too long to analyze. Um, I'd like you to analyze this data using the CPT mean var function. Um, and to identify which regions here have varying um, mean and variance um, within that. So again, I'm going to um, kind of have a break. I'm going to um, start again at uh, five two because it's it's forty now. So I'm going to give you fifteen minutes to again have a break away from the screen and also try and analyze um, this data set, and then we'll come back afterwards and share our um, conclusions. So if anybody's got any questions as we go through, um, just let me know in the chat. Did you remember that you have to change the method away from AMOC? So the default is only to find one change point. Um, so you, if you want to find more than one change point, you have to set the method either to bin seg or uh, pelt or segne. 105 from Tim M. Interesting. Okay. So I'm going to show I'm going to show you just one type and then we're going to discuss um, it here. So this is very, very different from um, a lot of the other data sets we've been looking at so far because this is a lot longer. So when we plot our time series, when we're looking at a long length of data, it's really, really difficult to see, um, you know, if, if you're thinking about an application where, you know, say 30 data points being different would be meaningful and important to you, then looking at data on this scale is just not going to give you a clue as to whether um, 30 data points within this mass of black might be sufficiently different. OK, um, so we can clearly see that the that there is um, differences in the number of um, in in the levels going on here. 
and um, potentially differences in, in the variability as well. You can certainly see a, a patch here just after 5,000 where it looks like the variability is smaller than the patch just after it, which seems to have you know, a much wider range of, of observations. Um, similarly, you've got patches in, in the beginning that have wider, wider variances than, than kind of over here around the kind of 1500 um, setting. So, but when you're looking at this data, it's really, really difficult to, to kind of look at this scale. We really need to zoom into different parts to, to kind of really visually think what the change point should look like. So I'm gonna show you one different example here. So I'm going to use a manual penalty. So I've done pen, penalty equals manual. We use a penalty of 14. So this is what we used within, within our paper. And for that, we get 805 change points. So those who are getting the 129 or 86 or 105, that penalty value there must be much larger than 14. Because as your penalty value goes to zero, you find more change points than as your penalty value goes to infinity. So those people who've got fewer change points must have had a higher penalty value, okay? provided you haven't done anything to the data. So this is mean and variance, and we're just assuming normal, normal distribution with mean and variance because we haven't changed our test statistic. So 805, and this is what the 805 looked like. Okay. So the sum here where, where you're kind of looking at these, these little peaks. Um, oh yeah, changing the mixed segment length. Yeah, that'll change the number of change points that you've got. If you increase the minimum segment length, if you had change points that were smaller than that minimum segment length, you should decrease the number of change points that you get. Okay. Um, so we've got some kind of dots here. So the red dots are the means. Okay. So we've got 805 across here. Um, so the dots, where they look like dots rather than lines, so there's some like here that look more like lines, the dots are obviously shorter segments. But as I say, given the length of the data, you know, it's not clear whether those segments are length two or, or length 200, okay? Um, or maybe 200 would be a bit, or 20, let's say two or 20, okay? So some of these dots that are a bit high, I'm, I may be thinking, oh, are these more due to just these data points that look to be unusual pulling um, the mean up. And obviously if you've got a, a higher mean and you're wanting to do it on a shorter segment, then the variance will probably be different to the variance of a longer segment um, there. So here um, I'm looking at this and I'm going, well, how do I know that this number versus the 129 or the 44 or the 86, how do we know which one's best, okay? And so that's kind of looking at it here. So does this number of change points appear reasonable? And it's really, really difficult to know without any contextual information going on. So in this example, this, so this is um, human genome from um, um, 10 uh, megabases to 33 megabases here. And so 805 for this data set is not too unreasonable given what the data set is and how often the chromosomal proportions are changing across the different um, areas of this gene genome. This is not unusual. But if you look at it, you might think, mm, do I really believe that there's 805 here? Okay. So what we're going to look at now is a method called crops. So setting that penalty value, you know, how do you know to choose MBIC over SIC or other things, especially when if you change those values, they give you different numbers of change points, okay? So this is uh, the crops method. This works for, for method equals pelt, and it's a way to get a range of different segmentations in a computationally efficient manager, manner, okay? And um, it, it works by having a minimum penalty and a maximum penalty, and then between those penalty values, it will give you all the possible segmentations, okay? So whenever I run this, I tend to run it with a small value and a large value. It does work if you put infinity in for the, for the larger value. Um, but de because this is running PELT more than once, depending on your segmentation, uh, your data, if it takes a long time to run the PELT algorithm or um, any algorithm on your data, then obviously doing something like this is going to take longer because this, this runs that several times, okay? And it will give you an indication at the very start of the maximum number of times it will have to run the algorithm. So if you know that's too high, then you can change these values uh, appropriately, usually bringing this lower one higher, okay? Because the lower one will give you more and more change points, which will need more and more runs of the algorithm, okay? 
but it all depends. You might, you know, the more change points you want, you, you might want to increase it. And the benefit of doing this, so th this gives you an extra um, slot, which is cpts.full. And um, this will give you the full set of segmentations. So for this example here, um, it says maximum runs of the algorithm is 10. It's run it nine times. And that's given um, here from zero change points there. So that's zero, um, sorry, that's not zero change points. This is zero change points because the length of our data. No, nope, well, I'm just sorry. Just trying to think on this one. This is V1. So V1 was 500 long, I think, wasn't it? One, two, three, 400 long. So it's 400 long here. So um, this is zero change points where you've got a row of nothing. And then this is one change point at 200. So if you have one change point, the best place to push it is at 200. If you have two change points, the best place to put it is at 102 and 200, okay? When you go to three, then the 200 disappears. So the 102 stays, but the 200 disappears and it's now 201 and 206, okay? When you go to four, this 102 disappears. You keep the 201, 206, and you're splitting that into the 96 and the 133, okay? If you're going on to five, five change points is here. We don't have a segmentation with six change points, okay? It's either five or it is seven. So you cannot have a best segmentation that has six change points because it's always going to be better to either have five or seven, okay? And this happens sometimes um, in this type of data. And the reason why is because this, so if you notice these ones are all the same, and then you've got 375 and 379. So what it basically says is that data, you can't add one change point in there and have a better segmentation. It has to be two change points. So if you start to think about the binary segmentation algorithm and how that works, that only ever adds one change point at a time. So there's a chance that you could, you know, put it in the wrong place, especially for, for this setting where you really need two change points um, to get to, to increase. Now, we're not saying that all of these are the best segmentation. We're just saying if there is a segmentation with one, two, et cetera, uh, five, seven, uh, eight change points, this is, this is the best place to put them. And then what we can do with that um, is, uh, oh, it also gives you the penalty values here. So these are the penalty values where you're crossing over those boundaries. So if you have a penalty value of less than five, so remember the smaller penalty value, the more change points. So if you have a penalty value of five, sorry, not less than five, five, then you'll have the maximum. If you have any, between, any penalty value between five and this 5.4 V136, then you will get the maximum number, okay? As soon as you hit that boundary of, of here, as soon as you go over that boundary, that tips you um, from eight down to seven, okay? When you tip over this boundary, that goes from seven to five, and then here, five to four, et cetera. Um, and from if, if your penalty is 474, so you can see we've got quite a wide range here, above 474, all the way up to infinity will give you no change points. And so what you can do with this is you can plot different segmentations. So I can do plot as I did before, but instead of just doing plot, I can do n change points. So number of change points equals five. And this only works for um, if you've used the crops algorithm or the binary segmentation algorithm, you can specify the number of change points. And then it will plot the segmentation with five. If I put six in there, it will tell me there's no segmentation that has six change points. So it, it kind of errors appropriately. Um, and yeah, so, so this is then going to give me the five and you can see what's going on here is, is that it's basically just highlighting this bit here where we've got a high bit of variance going on. So I may choose, you know, to say, actually, I don't believe that that's really a change point there. Um, and so I may, you know, want to do look something somewhere else. Another thing that might be interesting is this diagnostic. So when we have all of these different ones to help you choose which segmentation might be best, and um, we can use this um, diagnostic plot. So if anybody has done principal component analysis before, you're having to choose the number of components or other um, kind of choose the number of clusters and things like that, you'll typically have um, what's called a scree plot, where essentially you're always looking for the elbow. And that's exactly the same. This is the change point equivalent of that where you're looking at the difference in your test statistic. So remember, if your difference in test statistic is large, 
and that going from one time point, uh, going from one segmentation to the next, then that means that that change point makes a big difference and so therefore should be included. Um, so the way the algorithm works is that is that the first, um, so the first ones to be found here, this is the change at 200. So at 200 here, this is the largest change. Okay, so we've got largest change here at 200. And so prior to 200 here, that's going to be, you know, much different from after 200. And that's the most obvious change point according to the algorithm. Okay. And so that one's going to be included first. And when that's included, we have a difference in our test statistic of way over 400. Okay. So when we then introduce our next um, uh, change point at 102, then when we go to 102, then it comes right the way down here. Uh, sorry, so it's here. It goes, so from zero to one is, is this difference here. And then from one to two is this difference here. Okay. And so that then improves it a lot. After that, we get a very marginal improvement here. So the idea is when you in, include a change point that does actually need to be there, it's a true change point location, it's going to decrease your test statistic a lot. And um, when you finished including all the obvious ones or, or the true change points, and you're just um, adding change points that are there due to noise, they're not going to improve your test statistic very much. And so this is why we kind of get this, this straight line coming through here. So the idea being that where we are on the elbow, and in real life, it's never, well, it's rarely as clean as this. Um, we'll, we'll have a look at the, the um, genomics one in a minute. Okay. But so, so here, I, I would choose two change points, which is kind of going to be this, um, where are we? this 102 and 200, which is going to give me this one here and this one here. I'll do that. And this is really, really useful for when you're violating assumptions. Okay because all of those information criteria, the asymptotic stuff, they all rely on the assumptions that, that you're working with. Now, the PELT algorithm in particular is quite robust to some assumptions like the independence assumption. So if you have dependence within your data and you're using the CPT mean var um, uh, function, then there is kind of some degree of robustness to the, the data that's there. Um, I've got a publication coming out that demonstrates that the, um, the bias in terms of the number of change points is, is small in most circumstances, whereas binary segmentation is drastically affected by, um, by the um, independence assumption being violated because you get way more change points or, or way less change points than you needed. Yeah, Ryan, so this pendle value at full. So th this is just telling you kind of how wide that range is. So. Um, the premise here as well, um, so it's not inside this plot, um, but there's, an, there's a similar plot that you can do whereby you use these penalty values here and you basically say, well, if for a long period of time, um, my segmentation is, sorry, for a large range of penalty values, my segmentation is the same, that kind of indicates that um, that really should be there. It's not changing rapidly. So in, in these lower values here, so going from five to 5.4, et cetera, these are increasing. The, these are very small differences in the penalty will give you a larger difference in the number of change points. And um, it's kind of, I, I think it's completely off the screen here. Yeah, it's off the screen, but you know, you've got 474 here. You're, you're going, so you've got eight in this range, um, seven in this range, five, four, as you get to the three and the two, these penalty values are still very small. Um, and then when you get down to two and then one, there's a larger gap between two and one than there is between any of the other penalty values. So this is A, it could be used because um, you want to indicate to somebody how they can reproduce the analysis. So you might give them a penalty value between, so say you wanted eight, um, Eight is between five and 5.4. So below five, we haven't tested. So if we so here, we, we did a penalty value between five and 500. So below five hasn't been tested. I could put zero in there. And if I put zero in there, then I'll get a change at every possible location subject to the minimum segment length, which is two here. Okay. Um, so yeah, so that, that then tells me it's between five and 5.4 is the most I found, which is eight in this case. 
if I go lower than five, then I'll, you know, as I get towards zero, I'll start to include all of my potential change point locations. Okay. Good. Good. Um, okay. So there's an there's a similar plot that you could do here that, that uses the penalty values and looks at the stability of those, but I find the difference in test statistic is just as informative. Um, so that's kind of for the kind of how you choose the number of change points. I'm going to do an example using that now, um, but also using the cpt.np. So we're now moving over to look at the changepoint.np package. And inside there, there's, there's one function, which is cpt.np. And um, that just has one option in at the moment, which is the empirical distribution function. So that basically uses the empirical distribution function to look for differences in the empirical distribution either side of a change point. So rather than looking at the mean or the variance as we have done before, we're now looking at the whole distribution using the empirical distribution function, right, you know, as a non-parametric measure rather than making an assumption of normality or, or something else. Okay. So the familiarity that you've got from the change point package carries over here. So we've still got the data, the penalty, the pen value, and the method. The test.stat is empirical distribution by default. That's the only option that we have here. But the class, the minimum segment length here is one, and then n quantiles. So n quantiles here is how many quantiles do we want to calculate for the empirical distribution function? So if you think about it, um, if we have a segment of um, length 50, then potentially you could calculate, um, you know, for every single data point, you could calculate a quantile for that. Um, but then we've got kind of how do we compare that on that side with maybe um, 10 observations on the other side, for example. So how do we compare those two empirical distributions um, with differing number of um, data granularity? So this n quantiles just basically chooses the quantiles that we're going to do that comparison at from one segment side to the other. So the way that they're chosen is um, automatically to kind of spread it out. So as we had with the looking at going from the mean to the variance, we noticed that to get a variance change, you need more um, information about the tails of the distribution, okay? So the mean kind of behavior isn't gonna change very much. It's more about the, the tails where you see the huge differences. And um, so it kind of brings that um, to the fore. So if you chose n quantiles equals one, it would choose the median. Um, as you go increasing the number of quantiles, it puts more and more quantiles and it puts them more towards the, the edges of the data. So we basically go n, quant uh, n quantiles is one is the median, n quantiles is three will give you um, the median and the uh, lower quartile and the upper quartile. And then as you go from there, it starts to fill in, um, but putting more in the tails than it does in, in the main body of the data, because that's where we're going to see some of these differences. But you can have a look at the paper, which is referenced at, at the end to, to kind of get there. So I'm conscious that, that we've got 15 minutes left here. So I've got an example here. This is just a non-parametric example um, whereby we're going to simulate um, from this uh, normal distribution, but kind of have it in a different way in the way that we're, that we're simulating it. So it's not strictly a, a normal distribution um, at, for the end of, for the actual simulated data. So that's just if you, if you wanted to um, have a look at, at how we've simulated some non-parametric data. So here, um, so we're simulating this with, um, these are our, our um, points of, through the distribution. So we're timing that by n, so these are our change point locations. So it's uh, 0 0.1, 0 0.13, 0 0.15, et cetera. So there's some that are close together, some that are further apart. And again, we can just use method equals pelt, um, n quantiles I've done here four times log of the length of the data. No reason for why that's there. Um, as I said, the, the default is 10. I think it should scale with the length of the data, but you know, that's um, um, an opinion, but it doesn't really matter. And then you can choose what whatever that is. And then we've got the, the change points there and these just recover the change points that, that we've done. So um, like uh, 0 0.1, 0 0.13, 0 0.15, et cetera. Um, there. And this is just a plot of what this data looks like. So it's, it's more of a change in mean here. So we could just have number of quantiles is one and we probably would find exactly the same segmentation because the median um, would, would kind of cover that on all of these. But you can see clearly it's not normally distributed in terms of the, the um, within the each segment. Okay, So we just plot it in the same way that we did before. 
So I'm going to look at some heart rate data now. So it's within the change.np package. So don't forget to do library change.np. Um, and we're going to use uh, data heart rate. Um, so I just want you to have a look at that data, see if there's any evidence for changes in the heart rate. And, and then at the same time, I'd, I'd like you to have a look at the crops method and see if you can choose the number of change points um, based on, on the slides that, that we had previously. Um, looking at that. So I'll, so it's data heart rate. Uh, I'm not going to put a break with this one. So I'm just going to give you um, till, um, let's just give you five minutes till 22 minutes past to, to do this so that we can wrap up um, afterwards looking at some of the assumptions. Um, so I'm going to put um, this up here just to show you how to do the diagnostic plot. Um, I'll give you a few minutes. Once you've finished, if you can just put in the chat how many change points you would recommend.
Okay, does anybody manage to have a look at the data and see if they've got an idea of how many change points they would put in it? No, I'm, I'm keen to move on because um, we want to finish on time at half past. Um, so one solution of that would be to just use the for log log n as, as we did um, previously for the number of quantiles and just use a, the MBIC penalty. Um, and so that would give you 33 change points. Okay, And that looks like this. So there's quite a number of change points in there. And in some places you might think, hmm, is that, is that What's that picking up there? Because um, it looks like it might just be a mean change or something like that going on. So this heart rate data that is dependent, and so you know that um, gives an inclination for there to be more change points um, than maybe there should be. So let's have a look with um, the crops penalty. Um, so here again, I'm going to choose a lower bound of five. There's no real reason for for why it's five. It's just I don't want it too low because then it's going to give me absolutely tons of change points that I'm really not interested in. I just want to get enough so that I can see where that elbow is. And then I'm um, again 200, but you, you could put infinity there to ensure you get all the way down to zero. So um, 91 potential maximum number of runs, it actually does 84. Um, so it's less than, than um, what is there. And so I'm going to create the, the elbow plot. So as I said, in, in real life, the elbow plot is never as clean as it is in simulated data, just because um, there's other things going on. So the way that I tend to look at these, and, and I'll often fit what's called a broken stick model here, which is um, two straight lines to this. So that's kind of what I'm thinking in my head when I'm looking at it. And if I fit two straight lines to, to um, this with, di with different trends, so you kind of, you've got one that's going to come through this, here and one that's going to kind of come across here, sort of around there. So somewhere around here is, is where we're going to say where our elbow is. And so there I'm looking at, well, are there any steep drops? And if there's a steep drop, I want it to be included. So I, I would kind of argue we've got a steep drop here going down towards um, 11 change points. Uh, but there's also a, a fairly steep drop there between 14 and 15. So. I would kind of say either 11 or, or 15 change points. So I would then look at that. You could you could also argue here kind of going towards more 20 because there is a, a, a bit of a drop there as well. Um, but certainly not 33, which is which is where um, the default MBIC penalty would have put it. Um, so this is 11 change points here, which seems much more reasonable. We, we've not really got something going on here where this arguably was just due to dependence in, in the in the um, trends that we're seeing here of the, the sudden drops and things. It could just be dependence that's causing that. Um, and then this is 15, where we just add in a few more at the end, where, where we have got a little bit more variability, I would say, and then that one in around 200 um, being added. So you can clearly see the difference between these two plots. The majority is the same, but you'll, you'll also notice that when, when you add that 200, so if I just flick quickly between the two, the, the two change points either side move slightly. Um, and so that's kind of taking into account um, and you wouldn't get that in the binary segmentation. Okay. So just in the last few minutes that we've got left, I just want to um, go through how we check assumptions. I'll, I'll cover more about this um, in the second session as well. Um, but I'm going to leave you with a task that, that I'd like you to do um, over the next sometime over the next two weeks. So if we're doing a normal likelihood ratio test, the, the key um, assumptions that we're looking at are independence of data points. We're assuming a normal distribution, um, you know, pre points and post points with those distributional um, estimates of the of the mean. And for a change in mean, we're assuming that the variance is constant across the data. For a change in variance, we're assuming that the mean is constant across the data. So the question is, how can we check these assumptions? So we can't check these assumptions prior to analysis, just like we can't calculate the variance prior to knowing where, where the changes in mean are. 
Because if we look at this one here, this is our first initial example, got a change in mean there. If we're looking to check the normal distribution assumption, this is our histogram. We've got a mix of two different distributions. So we can't check our normal distribution assumption without knowing where the change points are. Um, if you do try to, then it basically says it's not normally distributed because you've got here, um, this bimodal distribution is clearly not unimodal normal distribution. Okay, so if we want to check the independence assumption as well, you might think, oh, the, the change point shouldn't matter too much for that, but it does drastically because um, when we're looking at um, the autocorrelation function of a change in mean um, setting, it, the change in mean in induces what's called long memory, which is whereby the autocorrelation function is, has significant um, non-zero uh, values for very large lags and it decays very, very slowly. Um, so you can't check the independence assumption either. So that kind of says, well, how can we, how can we check this? So we have to check these post analysis because where we know where the means are. So it's kind of an iterative process whereby you fit a model, you check if your assumptions are, are valid. If they're not valid, then you might want to fit a different model and then look at the assumptions and um, yeah, look at the assumptions after the analysis, check and see if they fit. Okay. Um, so I would always ad advocate checking the residuals. So you kind of take your estimated mean and variance and look at the residuals from that model. Um, so we can get the means here by doing parameter S dollar mean, as we looked at before. And then I'm, I'm just going to use rep here to replicate um, the means for, because this is just the segment means, I'm going to replicate those means for, to get the means for each data point. And so I'm using the seg.len to get the length of each of the segments. So I'm going to repeat each value of the mean vector um, the required number of times for each segment. Okay, so that's just that's going to get me the mean at each location under our assumed model. And then you just look at the residuals by taking the original data minus that. And then we can do um, either a Shapiro Wilk test for normality, in which case we, we say it's no, it is normally distributed, uh, or Komogorov Smirnov test, again saying that it, 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 the p value is very high, the p value is low if, if you reject the, the normality assumption. So that kind of tells us that we're looking at more. Uh, normal data, which is good. Um, and then you can do a QQ plot of the residuals as well to have a check as well if, if, if you wanted to. Um, and then this is the autocorrelation function of the residuals. So if you, if you have a look at this, look at that. So all of that autocorrelation that was there was just introdu introduced by one mean shift. Um, and it's now completely disappeared. Okay. So that's really, really important if you're doing any kind of analysis as well, where you might want to be fitting long memory processes, you really need to be checking um, if you might have change points in there because they can make you think you have long memory when you don't. Um, so I'm going to finish there, um, bang on half past 12. And so I'm going to leave you with this task. So looking at the previous data sets that we've had a look at and check the assumptions um, using this re residual check that I've just discussed and just have a think about what um, effect any invalid assumptions might have had on any inference that we might make. Okay. These, these kind of full um, slides with the solutions in are on the same GitHub page, but if you look at the tags, there's um, a tag that says NHSM, which is the master copy that has all of the um, solutions in as well. So feel free to, to download that um, if you want the Kind of solutions or you know that kind of side of what i've what i've actually shown today but thank you very much everyone thank you rebecca i hope everyone enjoyed as much as i did uh, i can see people started clapping as well um so um thank you uh, from everyone uh just to let participants know um as usually please um make sure you fill out um our feedback form i'm just sharing it now it's going to be somewhere in between all this thank you we are receiving in chat box um, so yes, please uh, let us know how we can make our workshops better. It's one of our first experiences running such a huge conference online. And, also and as, as well, for, for me specifically, because um, I'm hoping the feedback will be collated before the next session. So if you've got anything that you want me to do differently for the next session, then please do um, let me know. I'm either by emailing me personally or, or by filling in, in that form, um, because uh, 
if nobody says anything, I'll be following the same format of introducing a concept and then having a task. Yes, thank you, Rebecca. Yes, in the feedback, you can choose which workshop you just attended. So please make sure you tick the right box, which is change put analysis. And also, I'm just sharing once again link to the um, uh, Eventbrite page. If you haven't registered for the change put analysis, but you want to attend, please make sure you registered so you will be uh, in the loop. And uh, this is everything from us today. Uh, thank you for attending. And uh, thank you, Rebecca, for presenting. And thank you, Jamie, for helping here as well. Goodbye. Thanks, everyone.